What is up, everybody? I am coming off an epic bear hunt with a buddy of mine. I'm joined by Eric Barber. Eric, I am Eric. I'm riding a bear high right now. I love it, Marco. I am on cloud nine. Yeah. This I is, wish I was the buddy that was on the hunt. I know. But I, uh, I mean, just it, the hunt could not have gone better. I'm on cloud nine. It made my spring, maybe my year. Even more so than the turkeys. <sighs> Those were great, too. Oh, man. Lot, lots of good highs yeah. this spring. It's been a good high. Good. Roll uh, that right into fall. Keep that momentum going. Now, you weren't on this bear hunt. I was not. But you're actually leaving for one here very shortly. Yeah, yeah. As we uh, record today, it is June 3rd. I leave the 12th. So, for Alaska, very, very excited. Hopefully, you will be returning here in a few weeks on yeah. your own bear high. I'm hoping with, so. Uh, just fantastic tales to tell. I'm hoping so. This is like my first like real bear hunt. So, I'm like very, I mean, we, we hunted, uh, that would have been oh, 2019. Sure. It was almost to the day. I got a memory yesterday in my uh, little like Facebook memories or whatever, um, but that we were, you know, filming and had a lot more other people in camp all that stuff this is like my first like time actually like holding a bear tag so i'm pretty pumped this is gonna uh, this is gonna be neat you're going on uh i was on like a like more of like a mountain bear hunt yep. and you're going on a coastal bear hunt yep. which is really neat and i've done that style of hunt in the past and i am very excited for you because it's going to be a yeah. blast yeah it's cool anytime you do any sort of hunting whether it's you know bear hunting deer hunting whatever where you got kind of like a combo thing going on mm -hmm. and that's what the coastal thing is really cool like you have fishing and hunting right baked into it versus like you know anytime you're doing just one thing like it's always awesome you know it actually helps you kind of hone your focus a little bit more but up there this time of year the days are like crazy long there forever so yeah. you know we're actually gonna be pretty close to summer solstice up there we'll, yeah we leave the 19th so we'll just miss it by a couple days but like the days are gonna be as long as they can get when i've done that uh for the listeners out there also what we're talking about right now has actually nothing to do yeah. with what we're going to talk about yes. today so uh <laughs> that's okay surprise surprise yeah. uh but yeah like my experience we'll probably podcast about your bear home you so i don't want to leave, leave too much on the yeah. table here but um you know, you can, can you see bears any time of day? Absolutely, but it seems like 4 p.m. is kind of like that magic hour where things start to pop and come out. So, which leaves, even if you sleep in, you have a huge window of time to go recreate and fish or yeah. crab or shrimp yeah. or whatever. So, um, sounds it'll, awesome. It'll be great. Optics I'm, are a huge part of bear hunting, but also they're a, a big part of whitetail they're hunting. They're a huge part of whitetail hunting. And I'm actually going to tie a little bit of our bear talk into whitetails here because I think it's really cool how uh, like we're talking about the same animal, essentially, in wildly different yeah, environments, definitely. which changes your optics needs. We all know whitetails. You can shoot hunt mountain whitetails. You can shoot farm eggland whitetails. Yep, river bottom, everything in between. River bottom plains, everything in between. So today... We're talking about uh, building the optimal whitetail kit, yeah. a whitetail optics kit for you. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of optics on the table here today. We have some new optics. They say don't bury the lead. We've buried it. We've buried it's, it. We dug a deep hole and we put the brand new crossfire spotting scopes right at the bottom of it. But hey, they're up at the top right now. They're, hey, exactly. It's uh, what... Uh, Maybe we just you, know, you kind of save the best knot for last, but uh, yeah. somewhere in the middle. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like an Oreo. You know, you got the cookie on the top, you got the cream in the middle, and the cookie on the bottom. The cream in the middle is like, that's what does it. You take those wafers with no cream. I mean, no they're one, good. No one needs that. It's the double stuff. Exactly. Uh, Eric, you hunt whitetails a lot. <clears throat> yes. I would say you cut your hunting teeth chasing whitetails. Yep. You're pretty damn good at it. Thank you, Mark. You're going to make me blush on the well, video. I say it every time. You're one of the whitetail killness folks I know. I appreciate I, that. You have a little bit of a sixth whitetail sense. Yeah. I feel. Spend a lot of time doing it, which helps develop that sense, yeah. for sure. What uh, what is your, uh, What's your senses doing in regard to, uh, to optics? And maybe we should... I'm trying to think about how we want to break yeah, this yeah. down. You know, you definitely have different needs from a bow hunter yep. and a rifle hunter. A lot of folks are like us. We're bow hunting and rifle hunting and muzzleloading at times. Um, 
let's talk about, I guess, you know, what you're doing, you know, what optics you're using, how you're using them, and, uh, and maybe we'll go from there. Yeah, definitely. And just to kind of like, you know, I guess set the stage a little bit. I mean, I've hunted them like up northern Wisconsin, big woods type areas, uh, more your traditional habitat that you have in like Wisconsin, I or southwest Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, um, what people think of like traditional whitetail habitat to like river bottoms and plains out west. So I've dabbled in a lot of different environments. Um, and the optics kit definitely changes as you go to different places for sure. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it stays the same. Right. You know, you're going to need a good pair of binoculars, um, which I still think are actually an underrated, uh, you know, part of people's whitetail kit. I still see guys head out without, without a set of binoculars. And yeah. I'm just like, I, I wouldn't turn around and not hunt that day if I forgot my binoculars, but I would be like, I would be irritated all day without them. Yeah, all definitely. Day. I'd definitely. Be, I'd be like kicking myself all day. Yep. So, I mean, like binoculars are an integral part. Rangefinder equally is integral, especially, especially for bow hunters, but especially for gun hunters too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then uh, depending on obviously if you are rifle hunting, rifle scope is going to fall into that. But now one of the things that I think we're really excited about is the launch of these new crossfire spotting scopes. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people, myself included, before running a spotting scope, and I'm not, don't, don't take this wrong. I'm not bringing a spotting scope into the woods when I'm whitetail hunting every time. Right. But they're actually a huge part of my preseason stuff, my truck scouting, all that stuff. And the reason we're pretty stoked about these crossfire spotting scopes is there's been a lot of people that might be on the fence like, hey, do I need a spotting scope? I'm going to use it for three weeks in August for some velvet scouting um, and maybe for some like early season, long distance stuff, whatever. Um, and they really couldn't justify the price tag for some of these higher dollar spotting scopes. Mm -hmm. Well, now there's a little bit more budget friendly, but yet feature rich offering with these crossfire spotting scopes that I think are going to bring a lot of people into, f into the fold that might've been hesitant, but know that they'd benefit. And now they can get into that with a much more accommodating price tag. I, absolutely. I mean, I look at these, I mean, there's a lot of folks that have likely identified the need. Like I have the need for a spotting scope in my whitetail, whitetail optics toolkit. Yep. Uh, but like you said, like, uh, you know, can I justify it? This, that, I mean, these things are really retailing for around the $200 mark. And the, the way I think about them too, you know, we talk a lot about like, we just, you know, how, how I teed that up is I was thinking like summer scouting. Mm -hmm. Think about what you invest in, you know, in the whitetail world, what guys have tied up in their cell cams, all to get a photo of a deer. Well, now, you know, digiscoping technology has gotten so great. Optics have gotten better and better. Optics at different price points have gotten better and better. Now you can kind of take your camera game to the deer by using a spotting scope, doing some of these, like one of my favorite things to do late July, early August is drive back roads near areas that I can hunt and kind of get a little bit of more in intel um, on what, you know, the deer are in the area. Hey, did this buck make it through? Or, oh, that's a new buck that I, I haven't seen before. Um, and, and spotting scopes are a huge part of that. Well, I know uh, Todd Pregnance from uh, uh, White Knuckle Productions. Uh, so Todd, rest in peace. Uh, but I knew Todd back in the day. He always referred to it as the velvet rut yeah. and loved it would talk about it and would do this sort of thing. He was using spotting scopes and I really like what you did there with equating it, not equating it to, but, but drawing the correlation with a game camera, right? Because what's the point of a game camera? Oh, I'm, I'm able to observe and gather data, but not be uh, having my presence uh, foul things up in the woods. Boom. Here's the spotting scope. You're doing the same thing. You're backed off. You're getting real-time information. Uh, you know, you're not dependent on, and I'm not saying trail cams aren't useful because they still are, right? But um, you're able to also, like, your trail cam's going to be in one spot in that field. If the deer don't come out there, well, yeah, you're they, not getting they them didn't that day. But if you're backed off with the spotting scope, boom, you can glass that entire field edge. Exactly. And if you want a different angle, you might be able to get a different angle or you just wait for the deer's head to turn or maybe he walks this way. And, and, uh, and also we're talking about uh, pictures. You can digiscope through it. Yeah.
and, and get pictures and get that data and, and, you know, quotation mark inventory. Yeah, definitely. And, and the inventory side is great, but the side that's equally as great is kind of understanding like deer behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, you can watch, you know, deer in a field 500 yards back with the naked eye. And like, you might observe a couple little like nuances, but when you really zoom in and get in on them, like, you know, maybe you, maybe that buck in, uh, early August before he's even shed his velvet, um, is posturing up, you know, when other bucks enter the field, you know, that's going to be an aggressive buck come fall and something that, you know, okay, how does that, that equate back to information for a whitetail hunter? Well, Hey, I want to shoot that deer. If I see him, I'm probably going to throw a snort wheeze at him, rattle at him, grunt at him because I've be observed aggressive tendencies because I've been using, you know, optics that help me see more than just like the, the broad stroke. Yeah. So if it's an area that you, maybe you're, um, not as familiar with, maybe you haven't actually dove in there. You might be able to tell like, okay, well deer, the deer came out there. Well, that's really good to know. And then you zoom in with the spotter and you're like, oh, wait a minute. There's, there's a, a, a opening. There's a fence gap there, or there's something, there's another piece of information there that's related to the deer and why they ended up there or what they're feeding on or, or, or actually, oh man, the beans are actually still green way back in that shadowy corner. That's why they're coming out. I think they're going to stay like that the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, you know, opening day is two weeks away. Perfect. You know, you're just putting up the pieces of your game plan together. For sure. I mean, man, that to, like a perfect example of that a couple of years ago is 2020. My dad and I were hunting out in uh, North Dakota and it was early season. Um, you know, they have a September one ish opener out there. And we went in to hunt this evening. Long story short, we couldn't get in to hunt because we were coming in over like some pretty, you know, rugged cliff banks that we got, literally got cliffed out. Sounds weird. Whitetail hunting <laughs> happened. <laughs> you, don't, you don't hear that <laughs> yeah. that often. Yeah. Um, but anyways, w w when we got cliffed out, I'm like, well, let's make the best of this. And we just sat there and we glassed all night. And uh, I had our little, uh, at the time, the Razor 11 to 33 by 50, mm -hmm. now since replaced by the 13 to 39. Um, but I had that little spotter in my backpack and I pulled it out. And I wasn't pulling it out to like find deer. Like I could just look at this big alfalfa field with the naked eye from about 600 yards away and just see deer in there. And even with my binoculars, I could get a really good idea of like what bucks were the good bucks, what bucks were maybe, you know, more on the fence and whatever. But the reason I pulled that spotting scope out is all those deer were coming through a very specific like area of the field. Interesting. Pulled that spotting scope out and I'm not at all looking for deer. I'm looking for a tree. And I marked that tree. I marked a, a fence gap that like I knew those deer were coming through. And I shot that. I shot one of the bucks that I watched that the very next day at like 4.02 PM. Like he was one of the first deer on his feet. So I, I mean, and without that scouting optics pre-work, like yep, that's would, what killed that deer. Totally. Totally. That's the difference of like, Hey, I know exactly where I'm going and why I'm going here to sitting there with your Onyx in your hand or whatever mapping software you're using. Everyone's done this. Sit there, you spin around, you look at the map, you look up at trees, you're, you know, getting ground scent all over. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That was a perfect testament to why, uh, spotting scopes are an integral part of, of my whitetail kit. Yeah, I dig it. Uh, this new crossfire series, uh, really cool. Like forever in a day, the, uh, the old Razor 11 to 33, uh, I feel like we talk, even though we have the new one, we talk about it because everybody loved it so much, but that was the only compact spotter that we had. And so now we've got some additional options yeah. there. So we have, um, uh, a 12, this is a 12 to 36. So this would be like the baby crossfire, uh, a 16 to 48 by 65. That's the, the midsize one. And then a 20 to 60 by 80, yeah. in, uh, the big dog. Now, I think one thing, it's nice to have the options, yeah. but I think how I would most often be using uh, a spotting scope for whitetail hunting, and which is interesting because this is like somewhat, not opposed, but like if I can carry the compact and I can get away with it and it's going to do everything I can do in my backpack, that's the one that I'm going to carry. Yeah. For whitetail stuff, though, I'm in general, I'm not going as far. I have less stuff in my pack. I'm, I don't have to contend with, oh, I've got my sleeping bag. I've got my shelter. I've got my, I've got all my got four days, five days of food, whatever. So then like, I'm like, oh, I'll carry the bigger one. Yeah. So that's probably where I, I would lean. Now, if I was trying to do like a hybrid of things where like, oh, this is going to be my out west spotter and my, like, 
you know, maybe the the middle one or or the small one. And so. I think that's a really good good note too. Like we're talking about this from like a whitetail standpoint, but there's a lot of guys that are hunting out west. They're going to use this crossfire lineup and have great great results for it or with it. I mean, that's what, that's what I say. I'd say yeah. I mean, even if you're like you're born and raised lived out west, boom, now you've got an economical option to to fill that spotting scope need. If you're in the Midwest and you don't want to break the bank, this is a great option. And then if you ha- if you go on that, you know, you're like oh, I drew a mule deer tag, I'm gonna go for it. Boom, you already have the spotting scope. You're familiar with it. You know it. Well, and not only that, but optics retain value pretty well mm-hmm. too. So like if you're on the fence about adding a uh, spotter to your kit, whether you're hunting muleys out west, whitetails in the Midwest, or whatever, this is a great kind of like test it before you get like super in. Um, you know, hey, I'm not sure if I want to dump the you know, top dollar on uh, Viper Razor spotting scope, but I just want to, you know, kind of dabble, dip my toe in. Crossfire lineup is going to be a great way to do that. You know, hopefully you get in there, you realize how beneficial a tool like this is in your kit. Stick with what you got or, you know, sit on it for a couple of years and maybe upgrade once you feel it's necessary. Yeah. So. Yeah. It may be one of those things where you're like, oh, wow, this is super eye opening. You know, like you said, down the road. Oh, do I want? And I'd say these things are actually incredibly capable. They definitely outperform <laughs> their price point. It's oh, a little yeah. bit it's a little bit spooky what you can do. Yeah. With, with optics these days. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, if you upgrade down the road, you're like, oh, maybe I want to get like more into, uh, you know, digiscoping, taking images, and I want a little bit crisper, you know. I um, think of it no different than I like, than I do when it comes to like recommending uh, bows. Yeah. You know, like if you're new to archery hunting and you want to, you know, give it a shot, don't buy the brand new flagship bow because the one from five years ago that is legitimately half the price is still going to be awesome. Like it's going to, it's going to way kick above its price point. Mm -hmm. So, and that's exactly how I think about these crossfire spotting scopes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about them. I think they're going to be really, really neat. And I think they're going to do really well. They're great for looking through and they, they look like the form factor, the aesthetic, like I'm like, Oh, these are, these are, these are a nice looking spotter. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot more in your kit outside of just a spotting scope. We've spent a lot of time talking about that, but really like, you know, what we're kind of talking about today is building that all encompassing whitetail kit. Just your comprehensive optics kit. Yep. Yep. So for me, like I'm always going to have a spotting scope in that kit. Um, you know, whether I'm hunting, you know, doing some like early season inventory, like we talked about, or I do a lot of hunting like out, you know, west of the Mississippi. And when I am out in some of those States, like I love having a spotting scope, especially for the first like two days of a hunt, you know, taking inventory, figuring out Mm -hmm. like where deer are, all that stuff. Um, but then, you know, kind of moving into it, like we've got a couple different, you know, configurations of binoculars on the table. Um, I love these new UHD 832s that we dropped. Um, they are like my go-to whitetail binocular. Um, but, you know, somebody on the fence might be looking at, at those UHDs and understanding the price tag that's associated with them. We also have the Diamondback uh, 832, and I've ran these things for probably the past, well, before we came out with uh, the UHDs, I was I ran a, a prototype of the UHD two years ago. Yeah. Uh, and still running it to this day, but I ran these 832s all the time. Like, they're awesome in like a... Uh, a chest pack. They're awesome too. If you don't like, I, I know a lot of whitetail hunters that don't like a glass pack because they don't like having extra bulk. People sometimes have the, I will say, uh, ill-advised idea that your string is actually going to contact your glass pack. It's not. I think it's more it's up mental. here. But for guys that, that, that can't get over that mental hurdle, these are awesome. These little, uh, you know, 32 millimeter binoculars, because you can run them on like the elastic strap. They don't weigh as much as something like a 1042, a 1050, whatever. Um, so they're, you're not going to get that bounce factor when you're walking. It's just a little bit more minimalistic, you know, reduces the weight felt on your shoulders. So I love the 32 millimeter objectives on, on the, the binocular side of things. So, yeah, I ran, um, I think we both got uh, samples of that uh, 832 Razor UHD. Yep. Uh, well, so that's what I ran. I ran it for a whole turkey season. I ran it all last whitetail season, and I ran it this turkey season as well. Uh, man, optically, they were off the charts, yeah. but the size and weight, I truly... 
you know me. I'm generally like a little bit of a more is better, bigger is better. Uh, it's uh, I would say it was hard for me to even like consider not running a full size binocular. Yeah. And again, I think a little bit, particularly with these, it was a little bit up here. Like, are these going to do everything I need to do? Man, for all my whitetail hunting, they were phenomenal. And one thing that I really enjoyed with them was because of the size and the weight was like really steady one hand operation. So like, I, you know, I was in a couple scenarios where like, you know, you've got your, uh, you know, your bow in your left hand, but you really want to glass, but I was able to really effectively yep. glass and do what I need to do with my binoculars. Um, and so that size and weight was, was an asset. Uh, I generally keep them on my chest, but actually I found myself a couple times, I just like to try new things out. Yep. Um, so I was, uh, I had that uh, HYS uh, yep. strap from, from, tethered. from tethered. And so I actually just hooked my bino harness yeah. to that and used it essentially as like a bino bucket. Right. And it just kind of, it did, it did kind of free me up. And uh, when I, when I needed my binos, I just, you know, yeah. off I went. Yeah. So. You have them right there, right in front of you, eye level. Yeah. They're there when you need them and they're gone when you don't. Right. Yeah. I, uh, the, the other thing too, that I found with these is uh, they they are so like, they're, they're, it's, they're not cumbersome at all. So I found myself using them more, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know if that's just me in my head because like, Oh, shiny new thing. Like I want to spend some more time with it, but I did find myself glassing more just knowing that like it, it was so much easier for me to, uh, you know, get into some of those more awkward scenarios and, and not feel like I got to be bared down with two hands. Um, it's funny, like we're, in, we're, we work in marketing I always like whenever I see a photo of somebody like one handed glassing, I'm like, oh, no one does that with these little 832s all day. I know. Uh, going back to turkey hunting, which actually I'd say uh, binoculars just in general are under, underutilized yeah. turkey hunting as well. But um, I used kind of a specialized harness this year. Well, turkey hunting, I had a lot of turkey gear in there. I had multiple calls, strikers, extra shells, this, that, and the other. So my harness actually would have fit a full size binocular, yeah. but number one, optically, these were going to do everything I needed them to do. And I shaved size and weight. So like, yeah. it just like, it almost balanced out. It's like at the end of the day, it was almost like a net neutral of, a full size binocular totally. and all, or like and the, the space that it frees up by going to those micros. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree not to get totally sidetracked on turkeys, but I can do that very easily. We're in a, we're an interesting, we're in like a, just post turkey season, bear season, middle ground, but now shortly we're going to be thinking about white tail yeah. season. But yeah, I mean, just for context, that anyone might be familiar with the FHF chest rig. Mm-hmm. Um, I ran that with these UHD 832s. I was able to fit the binoculars, two slate calls, two strikers, three shotgun shells, a headlamp, a saw, and uh, of course, a little bit of toilet paper. Yeah, because you never know when nature calls. <laughs> All in my chest chest pack, um, without it being over cluttered. So I would challenge anybody to try to do that with a full size binocular, um, and to have that compromise of space that you get when running these things without compromising optical quality is awesome. Yeah. So yep, and like you said, we have different tiers. You know, I mean, that's one thing, and I'll probably reiterate this again, but. You know, we've got the categories of, and we haven't gotten to range finders and rifle scopes yet, but, you know, uh, range finders, rifle scopes, binoculars, spotting scopes. But we have different tiers of quality, performance, price uh, to where a person can find, you know, what's going to work best for them performance-wise and and budget-wise. Yep, exactly. And I guess moving into the range finder category. Can I say one more thing about yeah, binoculars? Yeah. So I brought this set of Viper HD yeah. 10x42s, right? Um, as far as like, uh, it's, it's a compact optical system, yeah. optical system. So like, you know, fairly lightweight, but also full size binocular that to me falls in that sweet spot of price and performance where you start to bump that top tier performance, but it doesn't carry a price tag remotely close to that. So you're getting, you're getting a lot, a lot of binocular for your money. And I guess that's our Viper HD series in general is kind of where, where that falls. But for a person who goes, yeah, I need a whitetail binocular, but I also am going to hunt out west, or maybe I'm going to hunt whitetails out west and east, whatever. You've got a 10 by 42, in my opinion, the most versatile uh, a good point. configuration, yeah. high quality optics, 
but not killing in your pocketbook book. So like to me, like if you said, well, I'm not going to buy an Opti just for white tail hunting. I'm Absolutely. not going to buy an Opti. A 10 by 42 or a 10 by 50 can be like your do all, do everything. And I'd say in general, my entire life, I've carried um, like a 10 by 42 or a 10 by 50. Like as like, I need one, you know, because a lot of people, we, a lot of us, we need one thing. You know, like I'm getting a binocular. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're going to get a binocular for a wide swath of things, you know, you might want to look at uh, a 10 by 42. Any trade show that we've ever done, that is the binocular that I recommend to everybody Where when they say, hey, I need a binocular to hunt. <laughs> you know, they don't specify what they're hunting. They're just, there's someone that wants a binocular that's going to, you know, be with them, whether they're hunting whitetails in the southeast or chasing, you know, high country mule deer out west. Yep. That those uh, Viper 1042s, you can't go wrong. Now I say that, and I just I spent uh, my entire hunt behind my uh, 12 by 50 UHDs on the tripod, but that's a little bit different hunt, yes, too. Yes, exactly. So, uh, should we get to range finders? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, here. There we go. So um, what I have in my hand right now is our Diamondback 2000. I would say for all intents and purposes, like somebody that wants to, you know, save a little bit of money and also have a very capable rangefinder for whitetail hunting, this Diamondback 2000 or the Crossfire 1400 is kind of where I would look at it. Odds are, even in the, the, the rifle hunting sphere, like for myself, you know, I've hunted whitetails with a gun my whole life. The furthest I've ever shot one is 150 yards. Um, and that is, you know, from hunting a lot of like, primarily my rifle hunting is done in the Midwest. And I'll, you know, hunt with a muzzleloader out West when I can. And even that, that's actually where my further shots have come, but it's still 150 yards. <laughs> I love yards, that your you further know? shots are muzzleloader shots. Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, and even if you are someone that's like, hey, I want to be able to shoot 500 yards. The Dimeback 2000, Crossfire 1400 are areas where you can save a little bit, um, you know, in your pocketbook and still get an awesome rangefinder that's going to do the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but we do have options in other categories too. The Viper 3000, I've been running that thing like crazy. I still have a prototype of that that uh, we launched before we launched it. Um, I was running it and I, that, that range finder has been rock solid. Obviously the more you go up in, uh, you know, in value, you're, you are getting more with that. In my opinion, the thing that you get the most is a more robust laser sy system on the range finder stuff that's going to combat fog and some of like the environmentals. Um, not to say the Crossfire and the Diamondback can't, you know, pull their weight because they certainly do, but it's just for, you know, that's really what you're getting is you're getting a more robust, obviously a more robust optical system, a more robust internal components when it comes to the laser, all that stuff. So you might be thinking, man, I don't need to range 3000 yards. Well, that laser is very, very, you know, uh, capable of, you know, ranging through stuff like fog or, you know, a little bit of rain, snow, sleet, all that stuff. So... Yeah, no, they uh, they hit uh, a definite a definite sweet spot. You know, you did mention the optics, and yes, your optics definitely get better as you go up in price. For me, I work at Vortex, so I can kind of get my pick of the litter around here. So, and I I do like to say, Eric, that I've grown accustomed to a certain standard of living. You do say that, uh, <laughs> but I love using uh, the Viper and the Razor because of that increased optical quality. Cause I'm oftentimes using that as uh, what I consider like a secondary optic because well, I'd say maybe even a little bit up until when I started using these, um, that's a good catch. Twos. Yeah. It's, I, I use it as a, sec a very subtle, like, ooh, I want to look at that. I, I can at, at the minimum confirm, yes, that is a deer. That isn't a deer. What kind of deer is it? Is it a buck? Is it a doe? Is some, who's following who here, perhaps? Um, and then the other thing is, if it's close enough in proximity, then I'm also ready. Yeah. I'm not having to make that transition from my binos to my rangefinder. Totally. Totally. Um, so, yes. And again, like runs the gamut all the way, you know, like if we're going to go good, better, best for a person who may not be familiar with the Vortex lineup, uh, and I always say this, I'm a broken record, our entry point, not entry level, you would go Crossfire, Diamondback, Viper, Razor, Razor UHD. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got a couple scopes on the table here. Yep. We have my favorite, and... and <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to discount all the other scopes in our lineup right now because I love the Viper 2 to 10 so much. It is my favorite scope we make. 
It is. I've uh, taken this thing from, you know, hunting big woods of whitetails up in northern Wisconsin where shots are, you know, if you're lucky, you're shooting 80 yards, um, unless you're hunting a clear cut. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, pretty close shot opportunities up north um, to hunting, you know, mule deer out in Montana with yep. this with this optic. And I have never felt under optic, under gunned, anything like that. I think that two to 10 magnification range is the most versatile sweet spot. Um, you know, I have, uh, driving is a a big, uh, cultural thing. Deer drives are a big thing out here in Wisconsin. And I've shot deer on the run in close quarters with this optic, uh, backed out at two X. Um, you do on the, the, so this is the new Viper HD two to 10, which they, these launched, uh, back in May of Mm -hmm. this year. Um, May pre- of 2024. Correct. Yes. For anyone listening in the future. Yes. That's a crazy thing We're to think We're almost there. I know. We're almost there. Uh, well, it is the future right now compared to when you brought that up. <laughs> but, Quit uh, twisting me up. For anyone that is familiar with the old Viper HS 2.5 to 10, the Viper HD 2 to 10 replaced it. Um, and one of the things that I do really like about this, this scope is the... Uh, push button illumination on the side, even on the two to 10. Um, and the reason I bring that up is we just talked about like, you know, moving targets, thick cover. If, if you do, if you are someone that like, Hey, I, you know, uh, every day on Thanksgiving, every year, you know, we do a deer drive, you will benefit from having that center dot illumination. Like it is instant draws your eye right into the center of that reticle. There's no searching. There's no, you know, uh, room for interpretation of where the center of the center is like it is right there. Yeah. So yeah, I love the two to 10. I, th- I think I have four or five of those scopes ranging from muzzle loaders to, uh, you know, my deer rifles. Um, and, uh, it's, if there's one scope that's going to do it all in the white tail woods for me, it's that Viper HD two to 10. So phenomenal choice. And like you said, one of the most popular, one of the most versatile. Yep. Now I said it earlier, I have a tendency to uh, go with the more is better. But I am a firm believer that there is, if some whitetail hunters, and I, and, and I guess I'm probably speaking to, I think I said this in a previous podcast too, uh, a, a recent one, but it, it bears repeating in this podcast because this is a little bit more hyper-focused on it. I, I think there's some white space yep. and when it comes to rifle scope selection in even like Midwest farm field, egg land country, um, as well as if people had a, some, uh, a shift in mindset yeah. of what they might be capable of. So this is a scope that I brought in yeah. one of, one of my new favorites. This is the Viper HD three to 15. And, uh, it's got, uh, a capped windage turret, but it has an exposed, uh, elevation turret for dialing, right? So if a person goes through the process of getting good ballistic data, they can dial their turret to execute very accurate long range shots. You might be like, well, I live in the Midwest. I don't really, uh, I I can't really shoot that far. But I think that's because you're kind of locked into maybe a previous mindset. We have a lot of agriculture out here. We have big fields. You think of like when the term bean field rifle came up, well, that, that, that came up because you could shoot over an expansive field, right? So, I'm the first to say that actually most of my rifle stand selections are actually more like bow stands, right? But I think there are definitely certain scenarios where you get on an open field or you're in the right spot or maybe you want to be backed off for a certain reason. If you if you did go through the process of getting your ballistic data and you know practiced and are able uh, capable of extending your f- effective range, there's definitely potential. Even where we're at here, you could get a 600 yard shot. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have this arrow in your quiver yep. to execute that shot. Do you you give up a little bit on the low end, right? So you've got a low power of three versus two. Yep. You're gaining five on the top end, and you have the ability to to dial. And, and we did talk about earlier when it came when it came to the binocular side of things. We talked about like one binocular to do it all. That's where I was going. So if that is kind of the thought process, like, hey, I have my hunting rifle, and I might hunt Wisconsin opening day gun season, but I might take it out west hunting elk, mule deer, whatever. That is where I start to very much correct back towards that uh, three to fifteen. 
whether it's in the Viper HD lineup or the Razer HD LHD. Um, those would be the two that I would look at really hard. Um, but again, like we've mentioned, you know, time and time again, as we talked about the spotting scopes, binoculars, rangefinder, same thing in the rifle scopes. We do have, you know, from the crossfire level all the way up to the razors, yep. there's something, you know, purpose built for nearly any application. Yep. So it really comes down to, um, understanding what the application is that you're looking for, understanding how far you're going to be shooting, you know, and really what your budget is. And that's what's going to help you kind of like gravitate towards one option or, or over the other. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, there, cause you can definitely make yourself go a little crazy by researching gear. You know, you can do it until you're blue in the face and oh, yeah. get that, you know, analysis or uh, paralysis by analysis. And I've been there, but I definitely do think like, if you just, if you think about, okay, what is the, the 80, 20, like what is the 80% of my application looking like? And look for something that fits that need really, really well. You're gonna you're gonna put yourself in the right spot. Absolutely. Sure. And then hopefully these optics. Yes. Put yourself in the right spot to get that shot. Absolutely, absolutely. This has got me excited for deer hunting, Mark. It's that classic case where you get ahead of yourself yep. because you have the task at hand of the bear hunt, yep. but then like somehow like I I can mentally like I like I get a season ahead when the current season hasn't even finished and it's just a whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Concentrate but on the bear hunt. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's, that is what I'm going to do. We'll start scouting whitetails when you yeah. get back. But yeah, I mean that from a, from a whitetail optics kit, I think we covered it. Like, I think that, that everything from like your spotting scope to your rifle scope, everything in between, um, a lot of options out there. It just boils down to finding the one that's best for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And luckily we have a lot of those options yes, available. Absolutely. All right. Well, Eric, thank you. Thank you everybody for listening. Hopefully this helps you decide what may be a good fit for you and your upcoming whitetail hunts. Good luck this fall. It is, it's always nearly upon us. Do we ever stop thinking about no, it? No, no, never. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye. Bye.